All right, here we go. Sermon on the Mount as we continue in Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're spending our time over the next uh, several weeks as we uh, then will transition into our Christmas series. But I would encourage you to read through it. You'll kind of know what's coming next and, and what to expect and where we will be and what we are going to be talking about. Remember we said this whole thing is about good news, the gospel, which is a Greek word called the euangelion. It's not a, not a spiritual word. They just took it from culture and said when kings went out and conquered land and then told everybody, hey, here's the good news, I'm here, and this is what I'm going to give you. That's the word they use to say, hey, Jesus has come with a new king, comes a new kingdom. And here is the difficult thing that we've talked about, and we're going to run into this all the time. It is both the already and the not yet. Now, we get the not yet because we sing songs about the not yet, uh, when we all get to heaven and I'll fly away. We have all these songs, right, that we sing about heaven and we can't wait to get there. And then there's days we watch the news, we're like, really, just come now. I mean, this would be great. So we, we very much focus on the not yet. What is coming, and we forget that Jesus came and we have a job here. I, I am so glad we sang the song we did this morning because I wonder, do we really believe it? That he is the God of this city and there's greater things yet to be done. Because I don't know about you, but we can just focus in, um, and for those of you watching online, I'm going to focus in on our city right now, Indianola. You know, social media has not been very good. I mean, everybody gets on and complains. We have this thing, and I won't call it what it is, right? It's just in the middle of the square now, and everybody complains about that all the time, right? It's like, oh, right? That's what we do. That's what we do. And so I wonder if that and our discussion about it and our tendency to be negative, come on, we all have complaints. I have a list too, okay, uh, that we'd like change, that we don't believe greater things are still to come in this city. We're just like, ah. Uh, I guess the best days are all behind us. It's over now, right? Or do we actually believe God wants to do something? That is both the already and then the looking forward to the not yet. Remember last week in the Beatitudes was, hey, right now there's probably going to be persecution. You do what is right. There's going to be people that don't like it, kingdoms that don't like it. And remember that, but the reward might come in the not yet where Jesus promises there'll be rewards in heaven. So this is a really hard thing to balance, the already and the not yet. There's work to be done here. God has called us here at this time, at this place, this church, to impact our city. And at the same time, we look forward to the day that he returns. And we juggle both. And I'm telling you what, it's just really hard, okay? We have more songs written about the not yet than the already. And it makes it really challenging and really difficult. And hopefully today you will see about what Jesus calls us to do in the already, in his kingdom here now that we are a part of, okay? And this is what kingdom living looks like. And this is going to be really hard, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the three things we're going to talk about today are all things probably most of you, if you've grown up in church or been in church a while, you've all heard of. And it'd be easy for you to go, oh my goodness, Ed, you know how many sermons I've heard about this? And just kind of check me out, and, and, and I, I understand, and it'd be very easy to get up here and just info dump you and say, oh yeah, but have you thought about it this way? That'd be really tempting. I'm going to give you a little bit of that to think about. I'm more, I'm going to be more focused on the application part. How do we do this, okay? Here's what Jesus meant, and that's really important because we're going to get to this, some of these things, and it's very easy to take 2022 central Iowa or wherever you're at watching, okay? It's very easy to take that mindset and transpose it on Scripture and stick it into all the stuff we're going to talk about. And most of us have done it, and I've probably done it before. I'm probably guilty of that because it's just easier to think about that. But what would Jesus' followers have heard in that moment when he talked about these three things? Salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. Those are three things you're going to talk about. And you're like, oh, my word, I've heard that. Yeah, you've probably heard it before. Salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. What did he mean? What did his followers hear that day as Jesus was talking? So here we go. We're going to, we're going to run through this scripture here in a moment. Uh, I, I want us to understand that if we live this way in the kingdom, it will make you stand out. You will be different. If you want to, if you want to cheat and go all the way to the end of chapter 5, and Jesus uses a quote, it's a phrase, and it gets, it gets kind of butchered at times and misquoted. But he really tells us, you know, be different just like your heavenly father is different. You're going to stand out. It's, you're going to be different if you live 
this way. You will be different. It's not bad. It's a good thing. It's the already as we look forward someday to the not yet. So here we go. We're going to be Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And these are where these familiar verses are found. And you've, like I said, you've probably heard of salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. And you're like, when the world's he going to tell me anything new? I, I'm hopefully we're going to apply it and not just sit around and say, oh, that's what a nice metaphor. Isn't that wonderful? We'd actually go and do it this week. That when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at your job, when you're at home, when you're in Walmart, that you would actually do these three things. That we could be salt of the earth, light of the world, city on a hill. So here we go. You are the salt of the earth. But if a salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but they put it on a light stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, salt, light, city, in the same way as those three things. Let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and tell you you're wonderful. Oh. Sorry, I didn't go to the next slide there, right? We, we tend to want to do that right now. But, but, but remember, it's the already, and maybe the not yet is who they're going to praise. And give honor to your Father in heaven. Maybe you'll never hear about it. But they'll honor your Father in heaven, your heavenly Father, Jesus says. You may never hear about it. Nobody's going to come up and say, wow, you were great salt today. That doubt they're going to say that, okay? But they might say, hmm, I think that's, I think that's a person who's like a Christian. They go to, go to like church. They they worship somebody named God, and 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 they actually follow him. They actually read something called a Bible. Could that be one of those people? Because gosh, they they really acted differently in that moment. They did something different than I would have expected. And perhaps when we're salt and light and a city on a hill, it ultimately praises our Father and gives Him all the honor and the glory. So let's dive into this salt. Light, city on a hill. Now, it'd be easy, right, to stand up here, pop some popcorn, dump a bunch of salt on it, hand it out, and say, just go do that this week, right? That would be really easy because this is what we just tend to do. I tend to do this the same way. I read this in Scripture and say, oh, salt, yeah, awesome. So your doctor tells you it's not awesome, and some of you have heard that, right? And you're like, ah, oh, but I love salt. I need salt. And, right, you found other ways to deal with salt, and that's, that's our concept of salt is a is something we have in the kitchen that we use in different ways but what if we stepped back in first century and say we're the day you salt now you gotta remember they're getting their salt from a particular place that you actually can go and visit today called the dead sea and at times it was called the salt sea they say and i've heard lots of people travel over there and did this you walk out into the dead sea in the salt sea and you cannot sink you float it's awesome. You just float because of all the minerals in that sea. So that's what they got it from. And you've got to understand what they used it for primarily was preserving and prevention. Okay? That's what they used it for. They did not have refrigerators. Okay? If they were going to take fish that were caught in Capernaum and get them to Jerusalem, they didn't call the truck, make sure it had a refrigeration unit on it, okay? They didn't even call for the ice and dump ice on it, okay? They had to get it there. They used salt to be able to do that. They also used salt in different ways for prevention of disease. If you've ever heard the phrase, rub some salt in it, okay? That, that's where that came from. Salt at times was valuable. Uh, it was more common in Israel because of the Dead Sea. There's different things that we know that they used it for. So in, in that context, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Well, what if we went back to an a example in Scripture we all know about? Lot's wife. She's turned into a pillar of salt. One of those things that everybody knows, okay, in, in their Bible. They, they know very little, but they know about Lot's wife, okay? She's turned into a pillar of salt. Why? Could it be that her longing look back to Sodom that she was leaving was a love, she preserved a love for sin and was carrying it with her. 
And God said, no, we've got to end that way of life in Sodom. We've got to end that way of thinking. We can't preserve anything there. We can't preserve the evil there. We can't preserve the way they think there. We can't preserve their actions there. And when she looked back, perhaps something to think about, that was her longing, and it talks about this. She, you know, wasn't a quick glance back. She looked back longing to, can I just go back there? Can we just go back home? Can we just go back to that city? Uh, she longed for that. And perhaps it was saying, don't preserve, don't carry with you a love for sin, which is perhaps what she was doing in that moment. Do you know, this is not easy. And could that be that's why there is salt and blood, sweat and tears? Because this isn't easy. It isn't easy to preserve the way of God. It isn't easy. And it's certainly not easy in our culture when most things are against what, what we are taught in Scripture, the way we should live at, from everything about relationships, how we deal with money, how we deal with in all sorts of areas of our life. Scripture just quite often stands in contrast with what everybody else thinks and what is common practice around us. So preserving the way of God, I'm just, let's just be upfront about this. This isn't easy. This isn't easy. This is not meant to be easy. If, if by, for example, that God wants us to understand, hey, there's, there's salt and blood, sweat, and tears. This is not easy at times. This is difficult. This is challenging. Maybe there were times it was easier to preserve the way of God and follow what he said. That's what Jesus promised us all the time. John chapter 10, verse 10. We based everything on that we do around here, right? That you would have life, life like everybody else. Nope. Life abundant. And perhaps life abundant is Jesus say, follow me. I'm going to show you the way to live. I'm going to show you the way to live that's going to be different, and, and God's going to call us to do something different, but guess what? You're going to preserve the way of God, and in doing so, I'm telling you what? It's going to make your life better, and it's going to make you better at life. It's going to change the dynamic of what it is. It will not be easy. Don't think it's going to be easy. Don't think it's going to be simple. Don't think you're going to coast your way through it. It's going to have its challenges if we are going to preserve the way of God. So, are we giving up or ready to preserve the way of God and prevent infection? Are, are we ready to do that? Or are we just giving up? Oh, it's hopeless. This is hopeless. You ever feel like that? I think sometimes that's what we do. Oh, it's hopeless. And, and, and you'd be like, hey, just sit down and have coffee with me. I'll tell you about my workplace. I'll tell you about this. I'll tell you about uh, this area of my life. I'll, I'll tell you about all these areas. This is just really hard. Yes. And we're probably ready to just quit in a lot of areas. And then get out any song we can about heaven and just pray for Jesus to come back. Okay? Do you know that there, there were other churches that did that 2,000 years ago? There's one in Thessalonica, and you should read about it. It's a book called Thessalonians in your Bible. Uh, they have got to the point where a lot of them just quit their jobs. Just quit their jobs. Jesus, please come. Jesus, please come. It's hopeless. It's terrible. Right? It's just, it's, that's where they were. And, and they're like, uh, Paul's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing? Get back to work. You have work to do. You have a city to reach. You have, you have things to do. What, what, what are we doing? And at times, that's what happens to us. We can just be honest about that. We get hopeless because sin just seems to win all the time. Evil seems to be ruling the day. And we're just like, we're totally surrounded. We're just totally surrounded. Do we have even a chance? And, it's, and that hopelessness causes us to not engage the already that God has called us to. But that's what Jesus followers, that's one of the things they would have heard. I, I heard the other thing, and I heard this just last night. It was just kind of looking around. One of the things they would get from the Dead Sea, one of the salts, okay, because there was many of them, was what we would call our salt today, okay, sodium chloride. They also got potassium chloride, which would, they would use also as a fertilizer, so it would help things to grow. Perhaps salt of the earth, guess what you're going to do? You're going you're to preserve the way of God, and you're going to help it to grow and flourish wherever you are at. Let's do that. And I know, if you feel hopeless today, I hope that you understand God is on our side. We are on the right team, and it may not feel like it at times. You may feel overwhelmed, but part of the gathering of God's people is to be reminded, no, no, God's not done. God's at work, and I'm on the right side. And maybe 
you, we just all need to be reminded of that today because it just gets pretty hopeless out there being salt. Second one, light. Light reveals what is hidden. It also causes things to grow. Now, part of the struggle is that, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I grew up with a street light right outside uh, our house. Maybe some of you did that. Some of you, you know, you're out in the country. You got to actually see uh, lots of stars, you know. Congratulations. That's awesome, okay? That wasn't my experience. Maybe it wasn't yours, where we don't understand darkness. We have security lights. We have flashlights. Do you know we have flashlights that are a million candle power? I mean, they can be a lot of fun, okay? You can have lots of fun with them, okay? Because things scatter when light comes, okay? Things scatter when light comes. So we, we don't understand darkness. We don't understand what it's like because we have so much light around us that we don't fully understand at times darkness. They had nothing. There are no street lights. They would have had a lamp. That lamp would be filled with oil. They could light that. If they wanted more light, they could, they could soak a rag and wrap it around and have a torch. That's it. Okay? That's it. As much light as you can consider that being, that's what they had. Okay? Wasn't a lot. Darkness was way darker than we think because there's no, there's no light, artificial light, shining all the time. And yet light causes things to grow. It's interesting, if you ever want to go back to Genesis chapter 1, after we're told that the earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, what is the first thing God says? Let there be light. Yeah. Well, why did he do that? Why did he start with everything else? Because you needed light to start everything. And so the God who is light, who creates it, is in charge of it. That's what he is calling us to be. Okay, what, look, at, look at what Jesus says in John chapter 3. People love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. By the way, this has not changed. This has not changed. People love darkness. People love darkness rather than light. And Jesus' words still ring true today. They love it. They like to operate in it, in the darkness. And what you and I are asked to do is to bring a light where we are at. To bring a light where we're at. Wherever we're at, wherever we're going, to bring a light into that. And it's not like it's going to be huge. It's one person. It's one person, I know. It's one person in your workplace. It's one person in your school. It's one person at your job. It is one person at Walmart. It's one person where you're at. And it can seem so overwhelming. The darkness is just all around. And I have this little light, and I don't think I'm making any difference at all. Yes, I know, because people love it. And that's what we get called to do, to be light and to walk in those places. So are we exposing darkness or just joining with the darkness? You know, are we going, man, this is too hard. Blow it out. I'd just rather live in darkness. Go with everybody else. So are we doing that? Because quite often that's what happens. We either expose it, and I'm talking about being mean, being cruel, right, I'm going, going into work and start yelling at people. No, no, that's, that's not what we do either, okay? We just, by the way we live, we expose darkness. And we either expose it or we join with it. And I wonder what we're doing. Because I would tell you it's far easier just to join with it. Far easier. Far easier just to join in and go along and just fit in and go along with the darkness. It's much easier much easier than to say no. I need to be a light where I'm at, and that means I have to do things different. For, for what, what seems to have happened is we've, we have a faith that's very much compartmentalized to Sunday. So we show up Sunday, and there's certain words we use on Sunday, and there's certain things we do on Sunday, but Monday comes. And again, we sit down and talk and say, well, Ed, you don't understand my workplace. Everybody uses certain four-letter words. So guess what I do on Monday morning? I use certain four-letter words. It's just me fitting in. It's just me going along. That, that, that's just the way it is. So, so we have a way we live on Sunday, and now we have a different way we live on Monday. See how, this, see how this doesn't work? Okay? So instead of just being who we are, we join darkness instead of just being different. And again, if you think exposing the darkness means yelling at people, going on social media rants, you got this wrong. 
you've got this totally wrong, because that's not what it means. It just means being there, being different, and let that let people be exposed to that. Wait a minute. You mean you're not? Yeah, but but we always cheat the customer, right? Come on, come on. We always take a little off the top. It's okay, okay? We bump up the labor hours just a little bit. It's okay. We all do this. And you decide, no, we're not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You can do this, but I'm not going to do this. That, that, that's not the way to live. Do you understand that makes a difference? That makes a difference. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know, I know. It's just the guys out here working, and we can just drop all these four-letter words, and we can say all these demeaning things about women. It's okay. We're just out here in the shop all by ourselves. It's not a big deal. What if you decided, yeah, I'm not going to join in with that? I'm not going to join in with that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different. I just don't want to join in with all that this week. You might be like, what's wrong with you? You sick? Something, something going on? Do you understand that exposes the darkness without being nasty and mean and, and pointing people out and being condemning of people because we just end up going way over the line of what God has called us to do? Just sit there and expose the darkness instead of joining with it. The final one, city on a hill. City on a hill is seen by all. I, I have given you what is the Hebrew word. This is one of those where Jesus would have said it differently, and because we've just we've we've translated in Greek, I've even lost the meaning of this. the The word in Hebrew is a city on a tell. A city on a tell is is really simple. Okay, a tell is an artificial mound created over centuries through the accumulation of successive layers of civilization built one over the other, okay? That, that's the way they would build. They would find resources in an area, and they would build their city there. And let's say for the Israelites that the Philistines came in and ruined the city, okay? They just wouldn't go leave that. Why? Because the resources we need are there. We found them all there. We're just going to rebuild. So uh, where, where Stephen is at right now in Lincoln, Nebraska, his his um, pastor, my friend Nathan, went to Israel recently. And they were in the town of Capernaum, which they believed Jesus was at. Jesus spoke there. They were in the synagogue. And they said, so you know, this isn't the synagogue Jesus was in. If we went below this, we would be in the synagogue Jesus was in. Okay? Because it's a tell. They built on top of one another. We're like, really? Really? That's just weird, right? We rip everything out. We take it down to nothing, right? We, we do those types of things, okay? Now, to, to use our example in our own city, okay? We didn't just knock down the courthouse and rebuild on its foundation, did we? No, that's not how we did it because we don't do that in our land. But that's what Jesus is talking about. So, so how do we look at it? In fact, I want to give you a modern-day example, okay? Do you know what the capital of Israel is? It is Tel Aviv. There's a reason it's that name. Okay, it's not just somebody came up with a brilliant name. It's Tel Aviv. In the Bible, you will find it as the city of Joppa. Joshua mentions Joppa when they take over the new land. It is mentioned also by Peter that Peter goes there. It is probably most famous by Jonah. When Jonah decides, uh, sorry God, I am not going to Nineveh, no way. He goes to Joppa. And that's where he catches a ship and he takes off. That's where he goes from, Joppa. Joppa no longer exists. The modern city of Tel Aviv is built on the city of Joppa, and that's why they called it Tel Aviv. It is a city on a tell, and it's ultimately the capital city of Israel right now. The mound would be prevalent and would not be hidden, and they would know, people would know, when they saw this city on a tell, because you could see it from far away, they would have resources which gave them hope. This is really important that we connect this this morning. Because that's what we're talking about. That that is what God's asked us to do. That the church is supposed to be the hope of the world. The already. Jesus came. Jesus did that. We, we glorify Jesus. We praise Jesus. And therefore, we're supposed to do this now. The already is we are the hope of the world. Okay, so are, are we a place of hope or have we become hopeless waiting for the not yet? Because it's so easy to disengage. Oh, there's nothing we can do. We just got to go into hiding. Okay, we just got to go and hide. 
and see what happens, and we become hopeless instead of a place of hope for people to find hope in Jesus. That's what they would have seen with a city on a hill. Oh, there's a city. They have resources. They have hope. They have what I need. That, that you could go into the city and be protected and have the things that you needed. Is that, is that how people view our church? Oh, that place has hope. I need some hope. I need some hope today. I, I, I will just make this a little more personal and a little more uncomfortable if you'd let me. Is that what you thought this morning? You're like, ah, oh, it's really that time. Oh, gosh. Right? As you tried to get your kids in the car four or five, six times, right? As, you, as you're like, oh, i got to make my way. Is that what you experienced as you came here this morning? That this was going to be a place of hope. I can be encouraged. I'm going to see people who love me, who care about me, who encourage me. Is that what you thought this morning when you came here? Or did you thought, oh, it's another Sunday. That's what I do every Sunday. I get up and I go to church. That's what I do. That's just what I do. And we, maybe we never even thought that you'd come here today. This was going to be a place of hope and encouragement. And we're going to sing together. We're going to open the word. Maybe you never thought about church today. I'm going to ask you to think about that. And I'm going to ask you to help us make this place that. We have people watching all the time. Welcome all of you. We're so glad you're joining us. D do you understand? That's what we hope to give them. That's why we do what we do. Okay. That, that's why we do it, to offer hope to people who need it. And I'm telling you, you would be totally surprised like I have been how many people watch from different places because some of you have connected them to this place because they needed hope and they needed a place to find some hope. So the question is, are we saw light city on a hill. Is that who we are? Is that who we are? And are we about to do that this week? What would it look like tomorrow morning? Salt and light. Salt and light. And as a church, we're going to be a city on the hill. We're going to be a place of hope. We're going to be a city within a city offering resources and hope for the people who so desperately need it. What if we just did that? You'd make a huge difference. Some of you are making a huge difference. I know you don't think you are. You're like, and I've, I've done this for like 10 years, tried to be hope and light. You don't understand my workplace. I understand there's people watching you, and they're very curious about why you live the way you live and why you do the things you do. And I would just encourage you, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, it's, pro it's probably really difficult to be in salt light in certain areas. I'm asking to hold on and be encouraged because God is going to work in you and through you. So as we end this morning, and, and I, I want to recognize for a moment, because I know she's going to have to leave quickly. Um, our, our pianist this morning is Ellen Schulte. She has been here on Wednesday nights working with the kids. And so uh, teenagers know her, been working with her. She, she graciously came and, and helped us out this morning, uh, and hopefully will more. So uh, just, you know, uh, I'm appreciative of her. So uh, she's taken this whole idea and said, how, how can we do it? So we're going to end with a song this morning that some of you are going to be, I think I've heard this at some point, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's really good, okay? Because it's going to remind us, watch the words. But you'll have to work, watch them more closely because you probably haven't sang this recently. We need to take our candle and go light our world. Wherever we happen to be this week, that's what we're going to ask God to help us to do. To take what he has given us the hope he's given us, and to be that wherever we happen to be for this next week. So let's stand. We're going to pray. Uh, the prayer team will be up front, and you can come and pray. They will pray with you over anything you'd like to be prayed for. And read these words, sing along, as we just ask God to help us make an impact in the world in which we're living. Father, this morning I just pray that you would help us we, we, we so want to follow you. And sometimes our following you has, has just not led us to be very good salt and light. Just haven't. Maybe because, Father, we didn't know it was going to be hard. We just thought everything came easy. 
And this is just hard. It's just hard. Following you at times is not easy. But we'll be better at life. And life will absolutely be better following you and joining with you in what you are doing. I pray you'd help us as a church be the city on a tell with resources and hope to do what we can for this city that we love and ask you to move greatly. It is easier to complain than to step in and be salt and light and that resource of hope, but help us to fight against all the things that would keep us down and keep us from doing what you've called us to do. Lead us, guide us, direct us as we sing this together, as we read these words. May they just remind us the hope we have in you and the hope that desperately our world needs and our city needs. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.